Hey folks, it's good to be with you. And love to everybody out there. And uh, we're returning uh, back to the issue of uh, Bob the Builder and um, the issues that were concerning the nature of Scripture. Uh, the formation of scripture and the preservation of scripture. Um, we left off on the issue of the Enlightenment and academic theology drifting away from the church and from a confessional basis and biblical uh, basis of, um, of the nature of scripture. Uh, that's where we left off. Um, and I just want to focus uh, just a few moments to reiterate this issue. Because um, it's specific to you, Bob. Uh, this is a, an area that you have said a few, on a few videos, uh, the importance of community. And I'm just sharing a, a different perspective, uh, and I believe a more biblical perspective, on how we define scripture. But it also has ramifications in terms of um, it, it has massive ramifications in terms of the church today. There are many, many evangelicals have come to this conclusion that it's the message, not not the words that are important. And I think a lot of it stems from popular books that have been written from academic theologians and people not realizing that these academic theologians are not as confessional biblical and have been influenced by post enlightenment secular academia and uh, I think that's where the problem is and it's a problem that needs people need to be aware of uh, so that people can remain biblical in their position about the nature of scripture. So I'll, I'll reiterate that again. So if we go to, don't forget my website is jasonburnspreacher.com and you can get me on Facebook, jasonburnspreacher.com and Twitter. So if we go to uh, the Gospel of Luke, in the Gospel of Luke, <coughs> Chapter 4, verse 1, it says, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. When they were ended, he afterwards hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it might be bread. And Jesus answered him and said, It is written, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by, here it is, every word of God. Now, he didn't say a message here, he said word of God. And the devil taking unto him a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, all this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for if, if that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, him only thou shalt serve. And he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a tabernacle, pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thou self down from hence, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, uh, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a reason. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a, f uh, a fame of him throughout all the region round about. So here, when the Lord was dealing with the devil, he quoted the very words of God. Not just a message, but the words of God. So our definition of scripture doesn't come from community, it comes from scripture. 
And then here we see how the Lord thinks about scripture and he clearly sees as words. And this is not quibbling like Pharisees and Sadducees quibbling about uh, the nitty gritty. It's about being precise in our definition of what the Bible teaches. If God teaches that it is words are important, then we have to take what God says seriously. So it's not about being Pharisaical and nitty picky, uh, picky nicky and saying, or, you know, let's just get the big message. We don't need to be bothered about the minutiae. No, it, it, it's not about being a Pharisee or a Sadducee, pick, nitpicking. It's, it's about being faithful to what God says in his word. And here our Lord Jesus Christ has ultimate authority. And he's clearly showing that the word is important as well as the message because he's quoting the word. Okay? The word of God. Again, I need to reiterate the importance of the danger of academic theology and in definitions. So, for example, I'll give you an example. Here we have uh, the doctrine of God by the Word of God by Karl Barth. And that's the life of Karl Barth. <clears throat> now, Karl Barth uh, was, was what is called a neo orthodox theologian. Neo orthodox. Him and M. L. Brunner were the principal neo orthodox theologians. So in the time of the 19th century, you had scholars like Harnack. And these scholars would say that it, evangelicals uh, worship the Bible. And basically, uh, we just need to focus on the message, not the words. Um, and that was classic liberalism, which, which went through not only the 19th century, but right up into the 20th century. It was a classical way of liberal processism to beat down evangelicals, uh, to accuse them of being scholastic, um, when actually the evangelicals were just being biblical, were just being faithful to what the Bible says. So after uh, the 19th century liberalism, round about the 1920s, um, Karl Barth came on the scene and he went to read John Calvin and Reformed theology. But he was very heavily influenced by liberal theology. Even though he was reacting against liberal theology, he was still steeped in liberal theology. He was still steeped in this idea that it's not the words that are important but the message. So in the 1920s, Karl Barth began to lecture on dogmatic theology and then later on uh, in the 30s, 40s, he began to work on his seminal work, which was his, um, his uh, Church Dogmatics, which is many, many volumes. Now in his Church Dogmatics, in this book here, he talks about... Um, that the Word of God only becomes the Word of God when you read it. But it's not the Word of God in it, within itself. It's only the Word of God when you read it. When the Spirit bears witness to you. When the community um, reads it. Right? But it's not the Word of God even if you don't read it, it's only the Word of God when you do read it and it speaks to you. And in that definition, um, you can have faults in the Bible according to this definition. You can have historical issues within this definition concerning the Bible. It doesn't matter. It's the Word of God when you read it and it speaks to you. It can have errors in it, it can have problems in it, but it doesn't matter. It's still the Word of God if it speaks to you. So there's another modern academic 
uh, way of thinking that's very similar to this idea it's the message not the words and that was neo-orthodoxy now if you look into the background of Karl Barth he was very heavily influenced uh, by various uh, liberal theologians and very heavily influenced by philosophy so his definition of scripture was coming from philosophy principally philosophy um, when he started preaching in, in uh, first preaching uh, he wasn't really he was preaching the Bible but he was really preaching philosophy um, and so what he did is he he took Calvin took the words of John Calvin took the words of the Bible um, but the words that he was using, the language that he was using, orthodox language, was coated in philosophy. It, 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 was, it was not the Bible that he was teaching. It was, it was a various views of philosophy that were underlining his understanding of the Bible. But in the 1920s, 30s and 40s, Karl Barth had a humendous influence in Western theology. Massive, massive influence in academic theology. So you began to get uh, even evangelical scholars who were saying that they were Barthian. But they unwittingly took on a view of scripture that was not via scripture. They took on Bart, Karl Barth's view of scripture, which his view was mediated from principally philosophy. So you had a whole generation of, of academic scholars influenced by Karl Barth, who were saying in their pews and preaching, uh, scripture only becomes scripture when you read it which isn't true. Scripture is scripture whether you read it or not. It's still the word of God. It's God breathed. And then they say scripture is only scripture when it, the spirit testifies to you. Well, that's not true. The, the, the scripture uh, is scripture whether you, you, you're you testified or not is still scripture. And there are no errors in the, in the word of God. So you had scholars that were influenced by Karl Barth, took on his theories and ideas, and there were many, many, many of these scholars, many of these pastors, and it became a prevailing view in, in many circles of academic theology. That's just one area of, of, of one view of scripture that became popular that had nothing to do with the way the, the Lord Jesus saw scripture or the way the Bible teaches scripture about scripture. Nothing to do with the great classical statements on scripture, nothing to do with the great classical theological reflections on scripture, but it was principally philosophy. So that is why I'm concerned with this idea that it's just the message that's important, not the words, because Karl Barth is an example of a theologian who took a very similar position. And many, many theologians and, and, and preachers took that position. But it was completely unbiblical. And behind it was massed the philosophy rather than biblical theology and it was dangerous it, 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 it Karl Barth then was able to define Christianity when he cut evangelicals off from the word of God he was able to blind many many millions of people in his day given the impression that he was orthodox but actually much of his theology was not orthodox at all he, in his doctrine of salvation he was a universalist 
meaning everybody's going to be saved. But he was able to make a wedge between the message and the word. That the word is not that particularly important, it's the message. And only when you read the word and it speaks to you, is it the word? And if there are faults in the word, don't worry about it. And these are ideas that are not in the Bible and destroy the faith. So that that's why I'm concerned on the on the definition of scripture on how we define scripture and what scripture is the very words of scripture are scripture and they are the very words are inspired of god not the ideas not the message but the very words that is the protestant evangelical and biblical position and i hope i've proved it by looking at what jesus says what the lord says looking at what the Old Testament has said and the New Testament on this topic. I hope I've given you some good reasons epistemologically why we should alter that position, uh, reasons theologically and reasons historically. So that position is, is held by also the Puritans. Um, these are not on that particular topic, but I'll just show you. Uh, but uh, Thomas Watson, Puritan writer, uh, Thomas Goodwin, a uh, Puritan writer, Stephen Sharnock, Puritan writer, uh, Thomas Brooks, Puritan writer. The great Puritans believed in what I taught, what I've taught you on the definition of scripture. Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones in the 20th century, uh, sorry, uh, Charles Spurgeon, uh, the great uh, Baptist minister, taught what I just taught about scripture. Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones and the definition of scripture taught it. You can get these books, I would encourage you to get anything by Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones. Uh, on this, on on, on, um, on any topic, and look up his views on scripture, and also look up Charles Spurgeon's views on scripture. Okay, and and also get this book, All Round Ministry. It will encourage you. All the apologists down at Hyde Park, I'd encourage you to get hold of this book, and Street Preachers by Charles Spurgeon and Knowing the Times by Dr. Martin Lloyd Charles. These are seminal books, not on that particular topic though. So, we've looked at the nature of scripture. Uh, now, I'd like us to just think about the formation of scripture. Um, a couple of books that uh, I would encourage you to read are uh, F.F. F. Bruce, the New Testament documents. F.F. F. Bruce, New Testament documents, um, published by Interversity Press. I would encourage on the nature of, oh, sorry, on the um, formation of scripture, uh, I would encourage you to, to get hold of F.F. F. Bruce. Uh, the New Testament documents and uh, this is an excellent work I'd encourage I'd encourage the Christian apologist down at High Park to get hold of F.F. F. Bruce uh, the New Testament documents and also uh, the heresy of orthodoxy by Andres J. Kostenberger and Michael J. Kruger published by Apollos so that's the information there This book is really an excellent book on the formation of the canon and I've really enjoyed uh, studying this book. And it's published by Apollos um, and uh, Daniel B. Wallace who's an eminent 
New Testament textual critique. It says a comprehensive critique of the Bauer Hermann thesis that the early form of Christianity was pluralistic, that there were multiple Christianities and that that heresy was prior to orthodoxy. The heresy of orthodoxy at every turn makes a convincing case that the Bauer Ehrman thesis is dead wrong. So I'd encourage you, uh, Bob, and apologies down at Hyde Park, to get hold of this book and read it because you'll really find it a help. Uh, so we've looked at the uh, nature of scripture and that was specifically to deal with uh, you, Bob, on the issue of community. Um, and I hope I've given you some pointers, uh, some ideas and thoughts uh, to reflect on. I hope you go and look at the resources that I've recommended to you. The Westminster Confession, Lorraine Bochner and Robert L. Raymond on the, the issue of the nature of scripture. Now we're going to go to the, to the formation of scripture. So in this book... Um, in the Westminster Confession, in the Westminster Confession, it makes the point that Scripture is Scripture because Scripture testifies of itself. All right. So. So we look at one page one oh five. It says this The impact of Walter Barr's orthodoxy and heresy in earliest Christianity has been felt in numerous areas related to the study of earliest Christianity, but perhaps no area has felt the impact more than the study of the New Testament canon. As we have seen, Bauer argue that the early Christianity was far from monolithic, monolith, but was found in a number of divergent forms, none of which represented the obvious majority over the others. There was no orthodoxy or heresy within the earliest Christianity, but rather there were various Christianities, each competing for dominance. Thus argued Bauer, we should not evaluate early Christian literature only on the basis of the view of the eventual theological winners, but we should consider all early Christian writings as equally valid forms of Christianity. Bauer's thesis has reshaped many aspects of canonical studies, but in particular it has impacted scholarly discussion about the meaning and definition of the canon. As a result of Bauer's influence, scholars have more readily viewed canon as a concept that derives entirely from the period of the early church history, a phenomenon that arose well after the books of the New Testament were written. The idea of canon is not something that preceded and led to the production of the New Testament books within the early centuries of Christianity, but is an idea retro, retroactively imposed upon the books by the later theological winners. This is, this is, this, thus it is argued the existence of the New Testament canon could not have been anticipated or expected ahead of time, but finds its roots squarely in the theological and political mechanizations of later Christian groups. Harold Gamble represents this approach. During the first and most of the second century, it would have been impossible to foresee that such a collection of New Testament scriptures would emerge. Therefore, it ought not to be assumed that the existence of the New Testament is a necessary or self-explanatory fact. Nothing dictated that there should be a New Testament at all. Jeremiah James Barr um, said this, a prominent uh, academic, says Jesus in his teaching is nowhere portrayed as commanding or even sanctioning the production of a written gospel, still less a written New Testament. The cultural presuppositions suggested the committal to writing was an unworthy mode of transmission of the profoundest truth. The idea of a Christian faith governed by Christian written, Christian written Holy Scripture was not an essential part of the foundation plan of Christianity. In addition to these sorts of statements, scholars also argued that the New Testament books 
were not written intentionally as canonical scripture, but rather that such a category again was imposed on them at a later date. So, the formation of the canon, uh, the modern scholars, many of them are saying that it was a, a, a later production of the church. Um, the Westminster Confession makes the point that the reason why we have scripture is because scripture, uh, because God has testified to scripture and that within scripture itself it has the authority. So what that means is it was no church or community conferred authority upon the scripture, but the scripture within itself testified to itself that it was scripture. All right. So what that means is uh, it, there was no community that chose the scripture. The, the community only accepted the scripture because the scripture was bearing witness to itself. It was scripture. The two views are important. The Westminster Confession view puts the authority of the Bible upon the Bible. Whereas the modern scholarship, if you were to take it, puts the authority of the Bible squarely in the hands of the church. Okay? Whereas the Westminster Confession puts the authority of the Bible in the hands of the Bible. And that's important because Roman Catholicism put, ended up taking that position and ended up using tradition and the church as a way of being more authoritative than the Bible. And also modern Western scholarship makes community and their academic theories of community more authoritative than the Bible. But if you start with the Bible as authoritative and self-attesting, it then means that you question the church and you question any academic attack or critique of the Bible. But uh, in page 109, it says, simply put, a covenant, Berith, is an agreement or contract between two parties that includes the terms of their relationship, covenant obligation or stipulations and blessings and curses. Although covenants are made between humans in Scripture, 1 Samuel 18.3, the dominant biblical concept of covenant focuses on the relationship between God and man, Genesis 15.18, Genesis 17.2, Exodus 34.28, Isaiah 55 verse 3, Luke chapter 1, 72, Luke 22.20, 20, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6 to 13. So we're looking at the covenant, the structure of the covenant. Now that we have seen how central the covenant concept is within the fabric of scripture, its connection to the issue of canon becomes clear when we examine the covenantal structure in more detail. The covenantal structure of the Old Testament is illuminated by the realization that it is patterned after the treaty covenants of the ancient Near Eastern world from which it came. So in ancient Near Eastern cultures, there were covenants. So you had the Hittite uh, preamble, the opening line of a Hittite treaty. Covenants included the name of the great suzerain king, etc. The historical prologue, this portion of the treaty laid forth the history of the relationship between the suzerain king and the vassal. The stipulations, ancient treaty covenants set forth the terms of the covenant arrangement and forth sanctions, blessings and curses. Hittite treaties also included the various punishments of their party. Verse, uh, page 111. When we look at the structure of key portions of Mosaic Covenant, such as Deuteronomy and the Decalogue, we see that it is clearly patterned after the same structure of these treaty covenants from the Near Eastern world. The Ten Commandments given at Sinai, uh, clearly the core of God's covenant with Israel, had preamble, Exodus 20, verse 2, I am the Lord your God, historical prologue, Exodus 20 verse 2, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, a list of stipulations, Exodus 20, chapter 20, verse 3 to 17, a list of blessings and curses, Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, 6, 7, 11, 12, and most notably two copies of the covenant in written form disposed, deposited in the holy places of worship, 
Exodus 31 verse 18, Deuteronomy 10 verse 2. As Meredith Kleins notes, the duplicate tablets of the covenant at Sinai reflect the customs of preparing copies of the treaty for each covenant party. Just as these ancient treaties created covenant documents as permanent witnesses to the covenant arrangement between the suzerain king and his vessel, so God supplies covenant documents to bear witness to the term of the arrangement between him and his people. Page 113, Canon and Redemptive History As we continue to explore the meaning of canon, it is clear that one of the primary functions of canon is to attest to and interpret God's redemptive activity. The two main covenants of Scripture, the Old Sinaitic Covenant and the New Covenant, are both established in written form after God's special and powerful redemptive work was accomplished. So, when we go back to your statement in your video, Bob, about um, community, um, and you're saying that they were only bothered about the message, uh, not particularly the words, we, we've already looked that from an Old Testament perspective that was just not correct. But also, um, from a covenantal perspective, you see, there was a covenant given um, in the Old Testament that that was get, and part of that covenant, the nature of the covenant was to give it in word form, in documentary form. So when the early church came into being, they were clearly thought themselves as a covenant people. And so they would add automatically a sense of the importance of scripture because the covenant was ratified in the documents of scripture what that means is is the idea that the church produced the new testament the idea that the church later on ecclesiastically in 300 AD or later or uh, conferred authority on scripture fails to see the, his, the biblical and historical context of the covenant that the people of God were a covenant people of God and so there was already an idea of the sense of the importance of scripture because scripture was part of, of the covenant so when the Lord Jesus died and rose again the early church would see themselves as part of the covenant, which would mean that they saw themselves as saw that their basis would be the word of God and that within their time, the representatives of our Lord Jesus, uh, the apostles, were producing scripture because they were covenant people and as a covenant people they would expect scripture because scripture is what ratified and confirmed the covenant so this idea of covenant um, is important in looking at the formation of scripture and what we're seeing here is the Westminster Confession statement about Scripture bears witness to Scripture. Um, we've given it an academic theological grounding through this book, through what I've just shared with you with this book, which is a completely different way of looking at it from the idea of community, and that it's the church that confers authority on the Scripture. We've looked at this cannot be because the very nature of the church was a covenant people and if you look at the theology of the covenant within the Old Testament and the New Testament with that idea of covenant came the idea of scripture that there was scripture to ratify the covenant so the New Testament the the, the people in the time of after Jesus the early church in the first 100 years would have the idea that their covenant people they would look to the scriptures of the past and they would expect scripture to be formed because of 
the expression and the fulfillment of the covenant. So the, they would expect the apostles to be writing scripture. Um, so it was not the church conferring authority on um, the scripture, but the, the church was a covenant people God. And as the covenant people God, they would expect scripture and that scripture to to be coming from God to ratify the covenant. Okay. So I would encourage you to, to get hold of this book, to read it uh, on the formation of the canon, which I think um, which I think would be a help to your apologetics at Hyde Park. So we've looked at the nature of scripture, we've looked at the formation of scripture. Um, and the both views are different from uh, Bob's understanding. Um, and uh, probably different than some of the apologists at Hyde Park. Not all the apologists at Hyde Park, but some of the whole apologists at Hyde Park. And I would encourage uh, the apologists at Hyde Park to consider the, the scholarship that I've just brought to you there about the formation of Scripture, to read the book and to discuss amongst yourselves the importance and significance uh, of this book uh, by Michael J. Kruger. Uh, the heresy of orthodoxy. So I'd encourage you to get hold of this book. Uh, it, it's by um, Michael J. Kruger and also Andres J. Kostenberger. Um, so as apologies to Hyde Park, get hold of this book. And also have a read of the Westminster Confession on the, on the formation of scripture. Okay. And uh, also this book, which, which um, on the canon, the reliability of the canon. Uh, it, it would be a slightly different view, it might be a little bit slightly different from what I'm saying in here, uh, but there's a lot of good historical information in here, um, in this book by F.F. F. Bruce. Okay. So we've looked at the nature of scripture. I'm sorry for taking my time, but but this is really important. We've looked at the nature of scripture. Uh, we've looked at the formation of scripture, and now we're going to look at the preservation of scripture. Before we look at, before we go on to that, I would encourage you to read this book as well. Um, those who are apologists down at Hyde Park, and who are Christians, I would encourage you to get hold of this book, IVP. Uh, Taking God at His Word, IVP, Taking God at His Word, Kevin De Young, Kevin Kevin De Young, and this looks at the nature of Scripture. What is Scripture, and uh, the definition of what Scripture is, uh, and it's a really really helpful book on. Um, David Platt says, My trust in God's word is greater, my submission to God's word is deeper, and my love for God's word is sweeter as a result of reading this book. I cannot recommend it highly enough. D.A. Carson says, Buy this book by the case and distribute copies to elders, deacons, Sunday school teachers, and anyone in the church who wants to understand a little better what the Bible is. So I'd encourage you to, to get hold of this book. IVP. Uh, Kevin De Young, uh, taking God at His word. Um, this is a book that many Christians in the church, if you could buy it, pass it on to people, uh, it will be a blessing to you. Yeah. So that, that's on the nature of Scripture. Get hold of the book, read it. Kevin De Young, taking God at His word. So. On the nature of scripture, this is the main one, Lorraine Botner. On the nature of scripture, and on the formation of scripture, this book, and this book, principally this book. Okay. 
but as a, a general theological ambience and thinking about the nature of scripture. This and this. Okay, I encourage you to get all of these books and read them. Now we're going to look at the we've looked at the nature of scripture, we've looked at the formation of scripture, and now we're going to look at the preservation of scripture. So, if you'd like to turn to uh, Jeremiah 36, Jeremiah 36. Jeremiah 36. We read, It came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, that the words came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take thee a roll of a book, write therein all the words that I have spoken unto you against Israel and against Judah and against all the nations from the day I spoke unto thee from the days of Josiah, even unto this day. It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I propose to do unto them, that they may return every man from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. And Jeremiah called Baruch, the son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord, which he had spoken unto him upon a roll of a book. And Jeremiah commanded Baruch, saying, I am shut up, I cannot go into the house of the Lord. Therefore thou go, thou, and read in the roll which thou hast written from my mouth the words of the Lord in the ears of the people, in the day in the Lord's house, upon the fasting day. And also thou shalt read them in the ears of all Judea that come out of their cities. It may be they will present their supplication before the Lord, and will return every one from his evil way. For great is the anger and the fury that the Lord had pronounced against his people. And Barak, the son of Nerah, did according to all that Jeremiah the prophet commanded him, reading the book of the words of the Lord in the, house, in the Lord's house. And it came to pass in the fifth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, in the ninth month, that they proclaimed a fast before the Lord, to all the people in Jerusalem and to all the people that came from the cities of Judah into Jerusalem. Read the book then then read Baruch in the book of the word then read Baruch in the book of the words of Jeremiah in the house of the Lord in the chamber of Gemariah, the son of Shephan, the scribe in the higher court, and the centri the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house, and the ears of all the people. And when Micaiah, the son of Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, had heard out of the book all the words of the Lord, then he went down into the king's house, into the scribe's chamber, and lo, all the princes sat there, even Elishim, and scribe, and Delai, Delai the son of Shemaiah, Elthanan, the son of Akabor, Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, Zedekiah, the son of Hanamiah, and all the princes, and Micaiah declared unto them all the words which he heard when Barak read the book in the ears of the people. Therefore all the princes sent Judy, the son of uh, Nathaniah, the son of Shalemiah, the son of Cushi, unto Barak, saying, Take in thy hand the roll wherein thou hast read it in the ears of the people, and come. So Barak, the son of Neriah, took the roll in his hand and came unto them. They said unto him, Sit down now and read it in our ears. So Baruch read it in their ears. Now it came to pass, when they had heard all the words, they were afraid, both one and the other, and said unto Baruch, We will surely tell the king of all these words. And they asked Baruch, saying, Tell us now, how did thou write all these words at his mouth? Then Baruch answered them, He had pronounced all these words unto me with his mouth, and I wrote them with ink in the book. Then said the princes unto Barak, Go, hide thee, thou and Jeremiah, and let no man know where ye be. 
And they went in the king into the court, but they laid up the roll in the chamber of Elshamah the scribe, and told all the words in the ears of the king. So the king sent Jehudai to fetch the roll, and he took it out of Elishama the scribe's chamber. And Jehudai read it in the, ears, in the ears of the king, and in the ears of all the princes which stood beside the king. Now the king sat into the winter house in the ninth month, and there was a fire on the hearth burning before him. It came to pass that when Judai read three or four leaves, he cut it with the penknife and cast it into the fire that was on the earth, until all the roar was consumed in the fire that was on the earth, the hearth. Yet they were not afraid, nor rent their garments, neither king nor any of his servants that heard all these words. Nevertheless, Elphanar and, De and Deliah and Germariah uh, had made intercession to the king that he would not burn the roar, but he would not hear them. But the king commanded Jer Jer Jeremiel, the son of Hamalek, and Sariah, the son of er uh, Azrael, and Shemaiah, the son of Abedil, to take Baruch the scribe and Jeremiah the prophet. But the Lord hid them. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah after that the king burned the roar. The words which Barak wrote at the mouth of Jeremiah, saying, Take thee again, take thee again, another roll, and write it all the former words that were in the first roll, which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, had burned. And thou shalt say to Jehoiakim, king of Judea, Thus says the Lord, Thou hast burned this roll, saying, Why hast thou written therein, saying, The king of Babylon shall certainly come, and destroy this land, and shall cause to cease from whence man and beast. Therefore thus says the Lord of Jeremiah, king of Judea, he shall have none to sit upon the throne of David, and his body shall be cast out in the day to the heat, and in the night to the frost. And I will punish him and his seed and his servants for their iniquity, and I will bring upon him and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and upon the men of Judea, and all the evil that I have pronounced against them, but they hearken not. Verse 32. Then took Jeremiah another scroll, and gave it to Baruch the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book, which Jehoiakim, king of Judea, had burned in the fire. And there were added besides unto them many like words so in this story God gave words to Jeremiah the king burned the words but then God gave the words again to Jeremiah what we see here is the doctrine of preservation it's reiterated in the Westminster Confession but we've seen it in Jeremiah 36 and we'll read we'll read L. Raymond on what he says about this passage finally often we f finally we find often find God commanded the prophets to write down their oracles in order to preserve them Exodus chapter 17 verse 14 Exodus 24 verse 4 and 7 Exodus 34 verse 27 Numbers 35 verse 2 Deuteronomy 31 verse 9 Deuteronomy 24 and tw verse 24 1 Chronicles 29 verse 12 and 19 Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 2 Jeremiah 30 verse 1 and 2 Jeremiah 36 verse 2 4 and 6 17 to 28 Jeremiah 36 is particularly instructive in that it gives us a graphic picture of the divine word and the actual process of assuming in scripturated form, highlighting the identification of the divine word with the finished product of scripture. This chapter shows that first the Lord is able to and does in fact speak verbally to men, second what he says he is capable of being in scripturated, third the words which were read from the scroll were the Lord's words and Jeremiah's words and the Lord spoke them, and Jeremiah also spoke them. 
underscoring what Warfield calls the confluent confluent relation between between the divine and human authors. And fourth, the process of inscripturating the Lord's words does not need to impinge harmfully on the purity and integrity of his word, for the words Baruch read at, at the end of the diction process, while still the dictated words of Jeremiah, were said to be also the dict dictated words of w which words, when destroyed, God required to be replaced by the same words, plus even more. Taken together, these passages demonstrate that the prophets of Israel knew that they were called of the Lord, sometimes contrary to their own natural desire, to speak his word. So conscious were they of this fact that they often designated the time and the place wherein the Lord spoke to them. See Isaiah chapter 1 verse 1, Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1, Jeremiah 6 verse 3, Jeremiah 26 verse 1. Jeremiah 27 verse 1, Jeremiah 33 verse 1, Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 16, and Ezekiel 8 verse 1, Ezekiel 12 verse 8. A further evidence, evidence that the message they brought to the people came to them, Abba Extra, the prophets, at times indicated that they did not fully understand something they were saying. See Daniel 12 verse 8. So that's just a, a bit of background information uh, to that passage. Uh, but the point is that the scripture in in that passage in Jeremiah was preserved, and um, the doctrine of the preservation of scripture is a doctrine that is not not heard of much in the church today. Yet we see it in that passage. We see it also in the Westminster Confession. This doctrine of the preservation of scripture, that God will preserve his scripture, is an important theological bulwark to defend the scripture. What it's saying, what, what, what the doctrine of preservation is saying is that God will preserve his word. He will preserve it from corruption and we've seen that in that passage. In that passage we don't get the idea that only the message is important, not the words. Or that um, if there are textual variants, we don't have to worry about the textual variants. Because even if we have things in the Bible that are not of the Bible, it doesn't matter. We don't get that idea anywhere in that passage. What we see is that God is saying, I preserve my word accurately. My words accurately. This doctrine of preservation has not been strong in the history of Christian theology concerning textual criticism. I've made two videos. Uh, this is to Bob the Builder now. I've made two, two videos on textual criticism and you've not refuted those, those videos. They, they look at the history of textual criticism and in the history of textual criticism, when Westcott and Hawke were doing their work in the 19th century, they did not work from a premises of the doctrine of preservation. They looked at it from higher critical, secular methodology of looking at ancient text. And if you do that, you can soon get yourself into academic trouble because you've not got a right foundation of looking at the data and the evidence. But if you have a doctrine of preservation, what you will do is you will go and, and look for where things have been handed down and preserved accurately, rather than look at things textually from secular academic ways of looking at things. So in the 19th century, there was a split a massive split between the church that believed in the doctrine I'm oh, sorry about this I'll get that in a minute I'll get that later uh, the church that believed in the doctrine of preservation and secular thinking 
that didn't see the significance or importance of that. And that split continued from Westcott Hall, who were bishops, but they weren't operating from this doctrine of preservation. So they came up with theories and ideas of ancient texts like Sinaiticus and Vaticanus without this theological bulwark within their thinking. And this secular mindset spread into Western academia concerning the Bible right up into modern times. So when you, Bob, are talking about textual criticism, you've got to look at the history of textual criticism and see that the history of textual criticism has not been grounded in the Bible. It's an understanding of itself concerning the doctrine of preservation. And I did two videos on that, and it, you, you've not entered into the historical scholarship there at all. You've not looked at the fact that uh, Westcott and Hall, and why they chose the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, the issues and the problems with that, and the, and the rejection of the received text. You've not delved into that or given any arguments against that. And that's my issue with James White, and that's my issue with, um, with Jay Smith, is they're following a, 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 my all issue with them, and my all issue with you, and some of the apologies down at Hyde Park, is you're unwittingly following, following a, a scholarship, an academic scholarship, that cut itself off from the church, that was rooted in secular mindset and thinking, and that approached things from that perspective. And so a lot of the textual criticism and the, the thinking comes from not a theological base in the doctrine of preservation, but from a secular academic base. So all the arguments that you might make, uh, it's interesting you didn't pick me up on the last ending of Mark because I, I gave some critical evidence for that. You didn't pick up on that. Um, but there is evidence, there is evidence to show that the woman committing adultery is in the passage. You said it's, in, it's, it's, in, it's, it's not only in Gospel of John, it's in other Gospels. Yet, yes it is. But you need to know why that is, because of the, in the history of the church, because of the use of the lectionary, um, the, the lectionary was used and uh, certain passages were put in the lectionary 